Tonight we are joined by Dr. Farish Noh, who lecture on the subject of the Southeast Asian cosmopolitanism, citing Banten as a pre-colonial model of a port city in this region. Uh, Dr. Farish Noh, who has not known him, is an associate professor at the S. Rajaratnam School of uh, International Studies at NTU. His research includes topics ranging from Southeast Asia history, Southeast Asian history to contemporary politics, material culture, art and antiquities, as well as the media. Uh, he has been collecting antiquarian books, maps, prints, photos, and memorabilia of Southeast Asia since the 80s. And ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome Dr. Parishno. Um, thank you very much, and thank you for dating me as well. Um, uh, when you talked about the emergency exit, it reminds me of a, a, a talk I gave at the uh, Japan Foundation in Tokyo. And at the beginning of the session, they said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if there's an earthquake, you know, that's the only exit. And sure enough, two minutes after that, there was an earthquake. But Japanese being so cool about these things, nobody was perturbed. I was absolutely terrified uh, for the next two hours. So I spoke as fast as I could to get out of that building. My apologies, thank you to NLB for another opportunity to, to address all of you. Uh, but to use a handphone metaphor, we all have handphones. Uh, right now, at this very moment, my battery is on the last bar. I, <laughs> I've had a whole series of meetings today, so if I come across as being somewhat uh, you know, worn out, burnt out, please excuse me. Um, this presentation is actually part of a series of presentations, and they relate to the theme of Singapore and Singapore's history and past, and I thought when, when, when asked to do this talk, I thought, okay, let's look at a, a contemporary of Singapore, let's look at another polity in Southeast Asia, and look at the pre-colonial past. And there's one theme that I want to touch on, uh, which is the whole theme of, of pluralism and diversity and cosmopolitanism in Southeast Asia. What I want to say is simple, that cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism and pluralism are not new things. They are not products of modernity. They are not things that have recently landed uh, on Singapore or our part of the world. There has always been a long history of cosmopolitanism in Southeast Asia. And what I want to try to show you today via reference to um, uh, uh, texts uh, from the 16th and 17th century are perhaps some of the earliest uh, impressions of an Asiatic, a Southeast Asian cosmopolitanism uh, on its own terms uh, that initially amazed, enthralled, and, and, and stupefied um, non-Southeast Asians who are visiting Southeast Asia. So that's basically what I want to talk about uh, today uh, via reference to, to one particular text. So let's talk about Asia, and of course, you know, today everyone talks about globalization. You know, uh, uh, every thesis I mark has a word globalization in it. It's the buzzword of our times. But you know, I, it's always been my contention, and I'm not the only one, that globalization is not new. Southeast Asian history is global history. It's always been connected to wider currents. But the difficulty that we today face, um, particularly those of us who are Southeast Asians, living in the present post-colonial Southeast Asia, is that in so many ways, our view of the world, our understanding of the world, um, is shaped by a vocabulary that is somewhat recent. So we live in an era of nation states, we live in an era of citizenship, we live in an era of borders. Within the framework of this established international relations, we, that's how we couch globalization. That's how we couch and frame pluralism and cosmopolitanism and diversity. We talk about movement between countries from one country to another. But what I want to get at is an understanding of pluralism and diversity and cosmopolitanism that predates this vocabulary. In other words, a pluralism before the era of nation states, as we understand nation states today. And for that, this is the kind of Asia that we are talking about. This is Munster's map, uh, 1589, 1598, from the Cosmographia. And I always use this map in my lectures, in my classes, because I want to assure my students how they ought to think of a pre-modern, pre-colonial Asia. Uh, and here is the Asian continent at large without borders. Um, uh, and it's, it's an interesting map. I like this map very much because there are names there which 
you will recognize until today, Malacca, Pegu, Arakan, Bengala, Beng Bengal, um, China, of course. And, and what I find interesting about this is the way in which even then, this is 1598 in the 16th century, we have to imagine a pre-Westphalian world before the emergence of the modern nation state with its very fixed understanding of territoriality, very fixed understanding of belonging, nationhood, and citizenship, which comes much, much later. So, so much of our present day vocabulary is actually very, very modern, very, very new. When you look at Asian history writ large, I mean, these things literally just popped out of the microwave yesterday. You know, these are new ideas. So I want to start with um, Munster, because Munster, of course, many of you are familiar with us. I'm talking about Sebastian Munster. Um, and Munster was uh, one among many uh, Europeans who were writing about Asia and Africa at the time when Europe emerges out of the Middle Ages and is encountering the world and encountering difference, alterity, otherness, and diversity. And I find Munster's images very quaint because in so many ways they reflect a very European view of the world. So everything is seen from a European lens. Um, uh, these are what Asians look like in Munster uh, and, and the sort of, you know, biblical genesis uh, uh, motif uh, is seen. But what I find particularly interesting about Munster is the way in which writing and, and, and working as he did in a Europe of the 16th century, he views Asia from a very European lens. Can anyone guess uh, what, what place this is? It's not Switzerland, I can tell you that. Anyone guess? This is Pegu, Pegu in Burma. And this is Tanesarim, also in Burma. Uh, of course, you know, historians uh, like myself, uh, we, we always love uh, pointing out these, these very quirky images, you know, the way in which the sort of post-medieval European you know, intellectual or writer or artist would imagine an Asia always referenced to uh, something that is familiar, something that is known. From the time of, of, of Munster onwards, Europe undergoes a very complex process of change because for the longest time, Europe's closest and oldest civilizational neighbor is the Arab Muslim world. And this is its first other. And, and so Europe's European identity, complex though it was, I'm not denying the internal complexity of European identity, complex though it was, had an other to frame itself against. And the other was the Arab Muslim other. And so you have a very neat dialectical understanding of identity. We are what we are, we are what we are not. And what we are not is the Arab, the Saracen, the Moor. And then something happens as Europe begins to constitute itself. A very good work, by the way, if anyone's interested, is Robert Bartlett's The Making of Europe. It's an excellent book about the emergence of a kind of European identity. As Europe begins to constitute itself, Europeans venture beyond Europe. Because remember, for the longest time, Europe has been more or less circumscribed by these powerful Arab, African, Asian trading monopolies. So Europe has to buy its spices from the Asians and Arabs. They can't go to Asia themselves. Basically, from the 15th century, this begins to change as Europeans travel beyond, and then they encounter the world for the first time. And what's interesting is when, what they encounter is not simply the non-European, but they encounter modes of living, modes of being, modes of existence that do not fit within a European template that they are familiar with. One book that I strongly recommend for those of you who are interested in this is the work of Anthony Grafton, New World's Ancient Texts. The Shock of the New, Discovery and the Shock of the New. It's an excellent book. What Grafton does is he looks at how, as Europeans begin to leave the confines of Europe as they understood it then, and as they encounter you know, other parts of the world, it seriously challenges their perception of who and what they are, particularly because a lot of knowledge, including geographical knowledge, then was grounded on revealed knowledge theological sources, in other words, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, Grafton talks about the discovery of America, which should not have been there. 
because it's not in the Old Testament, it's not in the New Testament. So when Columbus, when Vespucci arrived there, they had a problem. Why is this place here? Because it's not in revealed knowledge. Now either A, God forgot, or God was lying. It can't be either. So there had to be a way of explaining the existence of this continent that should not be there. And of course, you know, it begins with an etymological mistake where you, you call Americans Indians and they're stuck with this for the rest of their lives. You know, so, um, so from that point onwards, right, Europeans have to reconcile traditional theological knowledge with modern discoveries. A, a, a very good uh, example of this is Walter Raleigh. Uh, I, have, I have an essay, in fact, on Walter Raleigh in one of the earlier issues of, of uh, Bibliographia. And, and about how Walter Raleigh, as he wrote his account of the history of the world, was trying to reconcile these new geographical discoveries with traditional theological knowledge. And Raleigh believed that Eden actually exists and that you can pinpoint its precise location and it's actually somewhere in the Indies. Actually, I know where it is. It's actually Jurong. But, um, so, so, so Eden actually exists. So you have an attempt to reconcile science and theology. Now, in the midst of all this, of course, there's this problem. These people should not exist. They are there. How do we understand them? That's the backdrop to all this. Now, the one text I want to look at is this, which is the work of Theodorus de Brie. Uh, de Brie, a man who himself had never left Europe. Yep, lived in Europe throughout his life. But Debris, during his time, Theodorus Debris and his two sons, Theodore Debris and Israeli Debris, were among the most prolific producers of what were then called geographies. Geographies then were basically you know, as a generic term for works about other lands and places. So they would include maps and they would include images. And it's an account of, you know, India, it was an account of Africa, and, and these geographies became hugely popular uh, long before Thomas Cook and modern travel, and, and Thomas Cook's own bus anyway, um, uh, so long before modern travel, over, these were the first accounts of life outside the other, the other world out there. And a lot of these geographies then were actually based on what today we would call fake news, uh, you know, accounts of people who had come back. Because, you know, pre-Facebook, pre-Instagram, um, you rely on narrative accounts. So you have people like um, uh, Ludovico de Vretema, for example, who travels uh, across Persia all the way to China. He comes back, he writes this long account of his travel across Asia. And people like Debris picking up from these narrative accounts would then reinterpret, re codify everything, produce a, a book form. And the genius of Debris in particular was that not only would he recount these, you know, collect and recount all these travel stories, but also attempt to depict them on the basis of oral accounts. Like, okay, these people, they dress like this. These people, they, they, their, their trousers look like this. Their hats look like this. And so Debris and his sons, were prolific producers of these visual works that give us you know, uh, images, some of the earliest images of what the non-European world looked like to Europeans in the 16th, 17th centuries. Now, Debris is an interesting person. There's not much uh, that we know about him. Anthony Grafton, in his book, the one I mentioned earlier, New World's Ancient Texts, um, gives an account of Debris the Elder, yeah, Theodore, De, Theodorus Debris. Now, by no stretch of the imagination could you say that Theodorus Debris was a liberal. Uh, he was a deeply conservative man uh, who, um, by virtue of being a Protestant at the wrong place, also suffered religious persecution in Europe. Um, he was someone who was very consciously aware of his European identity and someone who injected into his work, his accounts, and also the images that he and his sons produced, a very evident Eurocentric and religious conservative bias. And this is very clear when we look at their works on America. Debris and Sons were uh, among those who produced the very first highly detailed images of native American life. But again, remember, they've never gone beyond Europe, so they're relying on oral sources. Now, what Grafton notes is that there's an enormous contrast between Debris' work on America and Debris' work on Asia, specifically Southeast Asia. Because in his images of America, Debris 
is morally and religiously repulsed by the accounts of Native American life that he hears, which for him represents everything that Western identity is not. And so there is an over-representation of aspects of Native American life which he personally found repulsive. The image of cannibalism, for example, pops up again and again and again and again. When you look at, I'm sorry, I don't have images of, 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 of you know, uh, America, you can Google these, but you know, if you look at Debris' images of, of Native American life, the impression you get is that you know, Native Americans, you know, they, they eat each other like going for KFC or whatever. There's like, you, know, you have these very quaint images of you know, um, Native uh, Indian gentlemen like sitting there, he's munching on someone's hand, you know, it's like, you know, I have a Big Mac or something. And, and this, it, it pops up again and again. So cannibalism, nudity, which of course, you know, then in a very conservative Europe was seen as something base and uncivilized. Um, violence, um, the rites of worship, which for him were pagan. These are the things that get overly emphasized in his images. And so this is how Debris and his sons built their career. They, they, they were basically producers of accounts and images of other lands beyond Europe. Now, somewhere in mid-career, Debris produces this book, The Econus, and it's extraordinary because it covers a vast part of Asia, India, Southeast Asia, and there is a striking contrast in the way in which Debris sees and depicts Southeast Asia. Because remember, he starts off you know, by, by depicting the Native American other as, as the, the moral, spiritual, civilizational other of Europe, you know, the direct contrast, the savage. Debris collects all these accounts from merchants. And of course, European merchants have been in Asia. They've been in Asia, they've been in India, they've been in China, they've been in Southeast Asia. And he collects these accounts and he begins to put them together. And what is interesting is, despite his, his very strong Eurocentric bias, despite his own deeply rooted cultural you know, bias and prejudices, Debris cannot depict Southeast Asia in the same way that he depicts South, uh, South and North America, because every account that's given to him recounts a story of an Asia that is modern, developed, prosperous, and he, to his credit, yeah, to his credit, despite his very conservative leanings, to his credit, he depicts this in a pictorial form as as you know as he received this information, and what's interesting about Debris work, this is the Econos of 1601, so it's the beginning of the 17th century, is that this work, and by the way, uh, this is my copy, but this copy actually has been scanned, so it's on the NLB website, you can actually go through it yourself, you, you, uh, and, and, uh, including the Latin text. Now when you go through the text and you look at the images, what Debris presents to his European readership is a very different image of Southeast Asia, with a particular focus on what was then possibly the most important port city in maritime Southeast Asia, which is Banten. Um, uh, quiz question, does anyone know where Banten is? Banten, Ban Banten still exists. It's to the west of Jakarta, and it is on the north coast, northwest coast of the island of Java. The history of Banton is interesting because it was a major trading center and it was a very, very important port city. And that's why I wanted to talk about Banton to locate Banton in the context of a maritime, commercial, global Southeast Asia where all these emerging port cities, Banton, Malacca, Aceh, Pasai, Jambi, and eventually places like Singapore, they're all plugged into this network. Now, I I'm suggesting, I, 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 I'm working on a hunch here, but I would, I, would, I would suspect that what holds true for Bunton then in the 17th century would have held true likewise for many of the other port cities of Southeast Asia. I think if, you know, these, these images are, are, are interesting because they, they show us how a conservative European thinker um, had to concede to the fact that out there in this place called Southeast Asia, there existed Asian polities 
that were already commercially active, where the people were endowed with economic and rational political agency, and where a kind of Asiatic cosmopolitanism and pluralism had already developed on its own terms by Southeast Asians themselves. So let's look at the images. Um, okay, that's the entry to the port city of, of Banten. Banten, like I said, still exists today if you're willing to, to risk the occasionally horrific traffic jam from Jakarta to Banten, uh, do try. I've been lucky once, I got there in an hour. I was unlucky another time, it took me seven hours to get there. But you know, you can swim as well if you don't mind, you know, from Jakarta to Banten, but you can get there and it's still there. Banten today has declined. It declined because of the Dutch East Indies Company, because uh, this is, this is uh, a, another topic altogether, but you know, when we look at modalities of colonialism, colonialism did not simply involve you know, bombardment and conquest and war. Another common tactic then was to divert trade, and what happened was when the Dutch got Batavia, Jayakarta, Batavia, and made that their center, trade was diverted to Batavia, thereby eventually uh, you know, starving Banten of its, its, its economic uh, riches and its contacts and its business networks and what have you. So it declined. It died a slow death um, through neglect. You know, it's, it's the politics of colonial neglect rather than colonial uh, aggression. But Banten in the 17th century was an incredibly important port. It, it pops up in many uh, manuscripts. It pop, pops up in, in Chinese uh, navigational records, for example, because all ships of Asia were going there. So here's Debris writing, you know, writing, producing, the book came out in Frankfurt, by the way, writing his book, he's hearing these accounts and, and he's listening to the sailors and the merchants and the traders, the European traders and merchants who had been there. So he's trying to imagine what they saw. And this is what he sees. Now, again, like I said, the images in, in Debris' uh, Econos is, is interesting because of the contrast with the images that he produced when writing about Native Americans. In the case of the Native Americans, Debris almost makes it a point to emphasize their lack, their lack of a European architecture, their lack of European clothes. Now, you can't do that in the case of Southeast Asia because every account that he receives tells the opposite, that no, hang on, these people are actually richer than us. They're actually far more active than us. They're far, they have um, bigger trading fleets. They're trading in bigger volumes than we are. And so he accounts these. And the images are actually very interesting. They're also quaint. They also display that cultural Eurocentric bias, but, but they are interesting in the way that they depict in a very realistic, mundane way, the sort of quotidian life in a complex, plural, Southeast Asian trading city. So we have images like this. This is a wedding. Um, and you'll notice that um, it, it, there are some people wearing turbans there. It's, it's not because the Ottomans have arrived, but uh, it was a very common uh, 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 motif then to use the turban to signify Muslims because the assumption was that all Muslims wore turbans. I forgot to bring mine today, but all Muslims wore turbans. So this was a, this was a simple visual device to tell you, okay, this is a Muslim. Banten is a Javanese polity ruled by a Javanese ruler, and it is a Muslim commercial center. But what the breeze images show is that it's a Javanese Muslim commercial center that is far more than that. It is incredibly complex and incredibly diverse. So we have scenes of ordinary life like this. Here you have the Sultan of Banten, and you might be able to recognize some things. You can see the Chris. Actually, it's not bad for someone who hasn't actually seen a Chris. You know, he gets it quite, he's not that far off. But you'll notice that um, this kid is passing something, you know, it's not a cigarette, uh, it's beetle leaves, beetle leaves, right? So, he, so you see, in so many ways, he gets it right. He, he manages to capture, you know, very simple, basic, everyday items, the, the beetle leaf set, uh, the Chris. But what I find the most interesting about Debris' images, and like I said, the, this, this entire book is digitalized, uh, it's in the NNLB collection, you can look at a depiction of all the different communities of merchants and traders and migrants and settlers and workers who were resident in Banten then, because all these other European merchants were coming back and saying, you know, you know, you know, we met so many different people. I remember at the, at the peak of its influence in Malacca, 80 languages were spoken, right? Because that's how diverse 
Malacca was. So likewise in Banten. So here we have you know, people of, 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 of different backgrounds. Uh, this is before Technicolor, so everything's black and white, you, you can't tell. But you have Arabs, you have Indians. Can anyone guess uh, this guy here? Burman. Why? Because uh, this is not a watermelon, uh, this is a, a fan. These fans, these are lacquer fans which are still made today in Burma. If you go to fly to Rangoon, you know, I mean, you got some few kyat left before you leave, right? Buy a souvenir for your family. They still make these, uh, uh, these um, lacquer fans. So we have Indians, we have Arabs, we have Burmans, we have Chinese, we have Koreans, you have Vietnamese. And all these people are resident in Bantam. And not only does he depict the different ethnic groups, Indians, Arabs, Burmese, Koreans, Chinese, uh, Vietnamese, he also depicts the different types of worship. This is where Debris' cultural bias or myopia comes, comes, becomes very clear. Um, he's trying to draw a Chinese temple. I've never seen something like this in any Chinese temple in my life, but this is a 17th century, like I said, this is pre-Instagram, right? So forgive him for that. He's trying to imagine you know, what, what a Chinese temple looks like. But I find this interesting because what it shows is that in the context of Banton's society, this is a Javanese Muslim polity that you already had, apart from mosques, you had temples of different faiths. So it's a multi-ethnic and it's a multi-religious society. And how is this society governed? This is perhaps one of the most interesting uh, images uh, because this image shows the quote-unquote, Banton Parliament at work. It's not a parliament because it's a monarchy. But what you have then is this very interesting setup where you have these concentric circles where the Sultan is there and he is consulting representatives of all the various communities. Now, within the inner circle, I'm assuming that this would be the Bantanese aristocracy. But then in the text, it explains that all the other communities are present because there are a large number of Indian merchants, there are Persian merchants, there are Burmese merchants, there are Chinese merchants. They are petitioners the king. So what you have here is basically multi-ethnic, multicultural politics. Right? Now, consider this. Put yourself in the shoes of a 17th century European. Go back to Bartlett, the making of Europe. This is a kind of multiculturalism that has no parallel in Europe. Compared to Asia, Europe is incredibly culturally homogenous. So here, literally, you have people of different ethnicities and different religions and different cultures and different languages actually coming together, and they're actually involved in the commercial and political administration of Banten. It is a Javanese polity. It's ruled by a Javanese king and the nobility, but there is a process of consultation. So these are modes of political activity which Debris cannot deny. He cannot depict Asians and Southeast Asians in the same way that he depicted the Native Americans because he cannot, there is no way that he can invent a story of Asian savagery or Asian backwardness because all evidence points to the contrary. Another thing, of course, because these are geographies and they are basically books on political intelligence and economic intelligence, Debris was fascinated by the advancement of technology in, in Southeast Asia, Asia at the time and, and, he, and many of the images involve things like ships and so in Debris, I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen this image, I mean, this one gets reproduced at infinitum in so many uh, books and catalogues. You have all types of ships. You have, you know, Chinese junks, the Javanese jong, you've got garais, you've got lanongs, you've got padewakangs, you've got Bugis ships, Javanese ships, Chinese ships, Indian ships, Burmese ships, all kinds of ships coming there. All of this, you know, basically points to a Southeast Asia that is not only culturally diverse and complex, but also a polity, a political economy that reflects this complexity and where Banton's economic success is the result of precisely these transoceanic linkages to other parts of Asia. So basically, the whole world is in Banton. The whole of Asia is there. China is there. Korea is there. Japan is there. Burma, Thailand, Vietnam, the Malay Peninsula, Sulawesi, India, Persia, the Arab lands, they are all there. The whole of Asia is in Banton. Uh, and then we have, uh, this, is, this may well be one of the first depictions of a Javanese gamelan. And then you've got um, more sections. You've got 
shipbuilding and then you've got you know uh, merchants selling fruit and stuff you've got your obligatory you know cool prom dance and you see that i believe i think this might be one of these infernal anklongs that i i cannot stand you know the cling, 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 thing, right so you have that but it's interesting so what what is debris showing debris is showing to his european readership these people southeast asians are actually far more complex. In fact, they are more advanced than we are. They've built an economic system that extends across the whole of Southeast Asia and beyond. They have culture, they have, you know, obviously um, languages, they've got um, uh, economic activity, political activity, all kinds of different kind of commercial activities taking place, and they also have weapons. For some reason, that guy has tried to shoot a bull in, in the bum, and I, you see the musket going off, but you have also here weapons including um, the, uh, the uh, Southeast Asian gun, the Southeast Asian Istingar. Remember in 1511 when Malacca was defeated by the Portuguese, the Portuguese later recovered 8,000 Malaccan guns, right? So the image that Debris gives, the final impression we have, is that this port city, Banten, one among several in Southeast Asia, is already something incredibly diverse, complex, developed. It's very advanced economically, culturally, and it is therefore different. It's different from Europe in the sense that polity, an Asian polity, that through its own system of values has been able to give rise to a kind of plural cosmopolitan society on its own terms. This is not a kind of pluralism that is couched in the language of political correctness we speak today, but rather something that evolved out of praxis, out of necessity, economic and political necessity, and it reflected the, uh, the realities of life in Southeast Asia. I think when we look at Singapore's history and how we understand pluralism and complexity in our part of the world, Southeast Asia today, these are important reminders. Um, under normal circumstances, I would take any of these sort of 17th century Orientalist writings with some degree of suspicion, some caution at least. But in this case, in Debris, I make slight exception uh, on, on the basis of the fact that, like I said, Debris himself was no lover of foreign cultures. He was very, very hard for him to, to admit that anything outside Europe could rival Europe. Well, when we look at the images, it's actually, you know, the opposite. I mean, Debris is really painting an image of an Asia that is in, in, in so many ways uh, actually far more advanced than Europe at the time. Far more complex, certainly. Far more cosmopolitan. Far more plural. Why is this important? Well, it's important because, as we know, you know, we, we live in, in a rather complex juncture of human history. I mean, everywhere around the world, East and West, you know, um, Societies today find it hard to deal with the reality of pluralism and difference. And in some parts of the world, clearly we see you know, instances, uh, evidence of, of, of some really nasty and virulent forms of exclusive politics on the rise, you know, ethno-nationalism, uh, people attempting to, to sort of you know, erase or eradicate certain aspects of their own histories that they find difficult to accept and accommodate um, you know, in, in relation to present-day uh, uh, political agendas and realities. In many parts of the world, pluralism and cosmopolitanism have become, you know, dirty words. It's like, oh, you know, you're one of those, you know, liberal pluralists. And it's very common, particularly in the post-colonial world today, over the last two decades or so, for some types of, you know, extremely conservative ethno-nationalist uh, movements to, to, to somehow present pluralism as a Western construct, as an alien idea. This is not true. This is not true. Any historian will be able to tell you that. And, it, and this is particularly not the case in our part of the world, Southeast Asia. Um, uh, Leonard and Daya will be uh, coming here soon to speak about that. And Daya's work always has been emphasizing again and again these, these long, long and far-stretching continuities, movement, right, migration, trade, settlement, which has led to a very complex Southeast Asia that we know today. The point that I wanted to make was simple, that basically when understanding pluralism and cosmopolitanism, complexity in our part of the world, Southeast Asia in particular, we should not fall into this trap of thinking that these are new things, which they are not, nor we should we think of them as being alien concepts, which they are not. Um, the merit of Debris' work is that, you know, through his own, you know, narrative and visual account, he has managed to capture what to me, amounts to perhaps one of the first glimpses of a kind of Southeast Asian pluralism and cosmopolitanism on 
local terms. Uh, it's, it's, it's a huge concession for Debris to make, like I said, because of his own political agendas and his own cultural biases. But I think the legacy of that is that it's, it's shown us, it's given us these rare glimpses of what a pre-colonial, pre-modern Southeast Asia might have looked like. And this we know for a fact. Like I said, Malacca, at the height of its power, was a place where 80 languages were spoken. Across Southeast Asia, we have a lot of evidence, you know, documentary evidence, narrative accounts uh, of how complex uh, the commercial polities of Southeast Asia was. So not only Banten, but also Malacca, Jambi, Palembang, Aceh, Surabaya, and later port cities like Singapore. So this complexity is somehow built into us. Uh, reading debris is a sort of time machine that takes us back to remind ourselves of the fact that this complexity is something that you know, our ancestors were capable of living with and dealing with because it was part of life. You can't escape it. If you look at Debris' images, you walk out you know, of your house in Banton and you're bound to meet someone from a different part of Asia. You be, you're bound to hear different Asian languages. You're bound to encounter different Asian currencies being traded because that's normal. It's normal. If there's one part of Asia where complexity and, 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 and cosmopolitanism should not be seen as you know, alien or threatening, it is our part of the world, Southeast Asia. And I think that's, that's the reason why I still regard Southeast Asia as being one of the most interesting uh, parts of the world to study. Apart from that, the food's not bad as well. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm convinced, right? So, so you've had pluralism in Southeast Asia for many times. So because I don't know the history that well, has there been flourishes or skirmishes of tension in that time frame, or is this tension, particularly I, I would cite the Muslims in India, the Muslims in China, which are now very much being looked at as, as the other, yes. and, and that, well, that's a whole topic. Um, is that really a modern construct, or have there been those, have those conflicts been there before? Th thank you very much. That's an excellent question, and um, uh, the answer is yes, yes, and no. Um, so, of course, Polities in Southeast Asia have, have been at war with one another. That's, that, that's par for the course. I mean, I, if there's one kind of historical revisionism I really do not like, I mean, remember, I'm a, I'm a historian of colonial Southeast Asia, so I've got nothing nice to say about colonialism, but I do not like this sort of uh, very naive, simplistic nostalgia uh, where some people say that, oh, everything before empire was perfect. It's like, you know, we're all living in some you know, Woodstock happy family. We're all hugging each other and with flowers in the hair, which is nonsense. Uh, Southeast Asians are more than capable of massacring each other without uh, Europeans helping. Yeah? So Southeast Asians have been actually killing each other in large numbers even before empire arrives. But in those instances, I mean, we have, for example, there are histories, there are kingdoms in Southeast Asia that have had many, many, many wars. The kingdoms of Siam and Burma, for example, have, if I'm not mistaken, had 28 wars. You know, even France and England are not that bad, right? So you have these long histories. But what are these wars about? Like the wars of pre-Westphalian Europe, they're basically wars for control, control of trading networks and opportunities because I need, to, I need to defeat that kingdom because I want that trade to come to me. Now, once I've done that, once I've defeated that other kingdom, that trade comes to me. That trade is plural trade because I'm not trading with one, I'm trading with everyone. So I want to wipe out a competitor. So you have that. Now, the second part of your question, when does the other become the other? Now, this is, the, for me, interesting. Now, here, read Hayden White. <clears throat> one, one of the, um, one of the uh, quotes I like from Hayden White uh, is when he talks about um, nationalism, and in particular, ethno-nationalism, and how ethno-nationalism gets so readily embraced in the 19th century, particularly by those who are struggling against colonialism. So you have this, you have the, the bugbear of the empire. You have to fight, you know, if you're, if you're Indo-Chinese, you're fighting the French empire. If you're Indian or, or, or Malayan or, or Burmese, you're fighting the British empire. But in the process of fighting that empire, you also absorb a lot of the ideas of empire. And one of the key ideas of empire is race. And when race becomes part of the vocabulary of Southeast Asia, then this kind of diversity very quickly turns into racial diversity. 
which is why I don't like, you know, uh, uh, I, 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 I cannot abide when people talk about colonial multiculturalism. Colonial multiculturalism is never, was never about bringing communities together. Colonial multiculturalism is about keeping communities apart. That's why in all these colonial cities, you have quarters. You have your Chinese quarter, your Indian quarter, your Arab quarter, your Malay quarter, because you don't want the natives to come together. Now, this is one of the sad ironies, one of the saddest ironies of the whole anti-colonial struggle is that so many of these movements, while struggling against empire, did so on the basis of an identity that became racialized. So Burman, Burmese nationalism becomes Burman nationalism, right? And, and when, when that happens, then the other immediately becomes, you know, either a collaborator with empire or a potential enemy. And if you look around us, I mean, your, your point about um, the Muslims in China is right. They've been Muslims in China for what, 14 centuries? Why is it suddenly now that it's become a problem, right? And, and, and Southeast Asia has always had diversity. We've had every major Asiatic, Semitic, Abrahamic religion is present in Southeast Asia. Yeah? You have Islam, Christianity, you have Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, you have all the major religions. For hundreds of years, nothing happened. Why is it suddenly today people are talking about violence? Why? Because it's a modern violence. It's a modern violence where identities get instrumentalized and weaponized. And I think, you know, in answer to your question, a modern historian would say that this is the result of modernity. You know? And so modernity doesn't necessarily take us all into the happy lands of Facebook and, and, and in global connectivity. Modernity also takes us to, to the genocide. Modernity takes us to the atomic bomb. Uh, modernity also takes us to the gunboat and the gunship and, 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 and carpet bombing and napalm and stuff like that. And I think this is, I think, the, the sad thing about what's, what we see in across Asia today. Yeah? In, in, in so many countries in the world, not just the West, but also in Asia, communities that have always been historically diverse are now you know, fragmenting because of the centrifugal tendencies of identity politics. And I think that's, I mean, identity politics is in itself complex, but it has, a, it has a negative side to it. And unfortunately, that negative side is what we are seeing today. Now, when you go back to these communities then, I mean, you, you see the BAC, so I, I know who they are, right? So they, you have the, the Burman. Now, would a Burman in the 17th century call himself a Burman? That's the thing, you see? And this is something that, again, historians would, 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 would come in. We would interject and say, look, you must understand, you must understand that and that pre-modern, pre-colonial period, our identities are far more fluid and complex, right? So. Asian identities are very similar to European identities all the way up to the late medieval era. So that's why you have names like Baker, you have names like John Butcher, you know, you have names like Jim Baker. Why? Because your identity is your profession or your identity could be your place. It could be your place. So you have Bukhara al-Jahari from Johor. You have uh, Muhammad al-Fatani from Patani, right? So your identities are not bound by a, a, a racialized ethnic identity that is fixed. And that's true for us today as well. We can be many things at the same time. I'm a husband, I'm a son. Being a son to my mother doesn't negate me being a husband to my wife. I can be both. I can actually multitask. You know? I can actually be husband and son at the same time. I can be teacher and student at the same time. And I think we have to understand how perhaps in this time, these people who are labeled, these are nominal labels, right? Um, perhaps, perhaps would not have attached these labels so strongly to themselves because you can have a sense of identity that is certainly not, not up to the 19th century, you know, uh, reduced in such an essentialist way to biology, to race. Race as an idea comes to Asia, to Africa, very late in our history. And by the way, if you look at all the languages of Southeast Asia, the word race is not indigenous. That's why it's translated almost literally, ras in Malay, ras in, 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 in Indonesian, because we don't have it. What we have is bangsa, which is nation. We have kaum, which is you know people, and our identities are linked to to things like place or profession, which can change. Now, like I said, the tragedy. What you mentioned today, uh, I think this is the result of modern nationalism and the kind of nationalism that we've inherited in post-colonial Southeast Asia is a very similar nationalism to the nationalism in Europe, which is post-Westphalian. Once you have a a nation state, you can only be this. You can't be anything else. You can't be A and B. You're either A or B. And I think this is perhaps one of the sadder legacies of our long historical encounter.
Uh, good evening, Dr. Farishno. Yeah. Uh, my question is that, based on your talk just now, mm -hmm. can we say that how Europe understand the Nusantara region later led to their different treatment of colonies compared to Southeast Asia and um, America, uh, the New World and Australia? Because you see that in Nusantara region, the sultans, the kings are being sort of maintained. Mm -hmm. But in America and Australia, you see there's the eradication mm -hmm. or reservation of the natives totally. Thank you. A very quick answer is yes. I'll give you an example. We don't have to go to America. We don't have to go to Australia. The answer is uh, Sabah. Now, in Sabah, how well do you know the, the political landscape of Sabah, East Malaysia? Sabah, East Malaysia. Yes, exactly. Now, now the interesting thing about the Karazan Dusuns, right, is that unlike the other polities in Southeast Asia, uh, we have very different types of polities. Okay, Bantan is a sultanate. You have a sultan, right? You have a sultan, one king, and then you have a sort of pyramidal structure. But you have other societies. You have, for example, like the Bajolaut, you know, the sea nomads. You have the Karazan Dusuns. Now, they have a system um, which is actually a kind of rotating chieftainship where you take turns, where you take turns. It's actually very similar to the Scottish clan system. So you don't have a one permanent clan leader, but it actually rotates from one clan to another. So likewise, the Karazan Dusans, who are broken into you know, um, more than 36 sub-ethnic groups, they too have a rotating system. Now, when the North Borneo Company, which is the British colonial company, came there, they said, okay, wh where's your king? You know, it's, it's, it's like that cartoon, huh? the alien land, takes me, take me to your leader. You know? uh, so they said, take me to your leader, where's your leader? Uh, actually, we don't have one. You know, we don't have one. We don't have a particular fixed leader. We have a system of rotating uh, uh, chieftainship. Now, here's the problem. The problem, again, is one of, of cultural transference. You come to Asia and you bring with you the baggage of your historical cultural experience in Europe. So you assume that you know, if you've left, say, England, which has a kingdom, you come to Asia, you expect to find the equivalent. You look for a king. Now, when they don't have a king, by default, there's your answer. They are not like us. They are less than us. You know? So that accounts for the different treatment that you have. But again, please do not flatten the West. Yeah? Because remember, even within Europe, you have different political systems. Remember, post-revolutionary France, you're talking about a French Republic, where the French, this is why the Indo-Chinese experiment is so interesting, the, the Indo-Chinese experiment, France was not a kingdom. It was a republic. Likewise, uh, when the Americans come to Southeast Asia, by the way, I've just published my book on Americans in Southeast Asia, you know, a completely shameless plug there. Um, but when the Americans come to Southeast Asia, Americans are really kiasu, you know, at the time. When the Americans came, they came late, right? So America has just... Uh, sort of basically you know, liberated itself from the British Empire. So when the Americans come, it's really fascinating to see how everywhere the Americans went, they would always tell, to the, uh, tell the Asians, yes, we are white, but we're not like those guys. You know, the, the British are empire builders, we are not. And, and so there, this accounts for the modalities of America's contact with Southeast Asia as well, which were very different. Because America only embraces empire at the tail end of the 19th century as a result of the American-Spanish War and the American-Mexican War in the mid-19th century. But Americans initially, the first 50 years of the 19th century, when Americans came, they genuinely came and presented themselves as a different type of Westerner. And that then affected the way they looked at people. So while the British or the Spanish or the Portuguese who had kingdoms came looking for kingdoms. They understand, you know, we have a monarchy, you have a monarchy. But, and when they encounter people like the Bajau or the Kadazans who don't have a monarchical system, they, they cannot comprehend it. The Americans are the opposite. When the Americans come to Southeast Asia, because they've just shed, you know, the yoke of King George, when they come to Southeast Asia, they cannot comprehend monarchy here either, because in the same way that they could not comprehend monarchy in Britain. So you have very different reactions. So in answer to your question, that's why studying this, this period of context is actually very interesting because different Western powers reacted very differently to different Asian polities. So what does it mean? One, the West is not homogenous, and two, Southeast Asia is not homogenous either. There are all kinds of political systems that we have in Southeast Asia. You know, you have like trading networks, you have trading federations like Lankasuka, which is not a kingdom. It's a, it's a network, a federation of trading polities. You have monarchies, and you have, you know, these systems like these shifting, you know, uh, rotating chieftainships. And likewise, the Europeans who came 
came either as republicans or monarchists, also with very different systems. Which is why you should study Southeast Asian history. You see, you get employed for life because there's so much to, 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 to read and, and study, you know? All right. All right. But, okay. Doesn't mean your salary will be good, huh? It just, it just means you have a lot to, to study. Um, my question is also related to the earlier question, which is uh, one of the reasons for the polarization of the communities, do you think? could be the bringing of Christianity with colonization. Mm -hmm. And because that was uh, forcefully put on to people in Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. together with the notion that the religious uh, or you know, beliefs that they had mm -hmm. were not quite up to the mark mm -hmm. compared to Christianity. Right. And this new idea in Southeast Asia probably led to a polarization, would you say? OK. Uh, thank you for that question. Now, when we look at the early arrival of Christianity, now, um, in, 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 in broad strokes, I personally would divide this long period of, of contact between West and Southeast Asia into three stages. Early contact, mid-contact, and late contact. The early contact is basically when Magellan comes, right? So Magellan comes, and this is the early contact. And this is, this is the time when Europe is, Europeans are leaving Europe for the first time. They, they've, 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 they've fought against the, the Arabs and Muslims, so they've been fighting a religious war. And, and this is undeniable. Um, ha, has anyone read Antonio Pigafetta? It's a, it's, it's a wonderful account of, of the Magellan voyage. Now, Pigafetta, of course, you know, is writing again as, as, as a European Christian. Yeah? So he comes, and for them, this is part of the Crusades. This is literally the tail end of the Crusades. And this accounts for the very martial tenor of his writing. I mean, Pigafetta openly yeah, writes about how many Moors yeah, uh, they kill along the way. It's like you know, every island that's killed some. And, and because they're fighting a religious war. Right? And so that, unfortunately, brings then to Southeast Asia, not only via Europe, but also via India and China, the vocabulary of the religious conflict of the West. Now, if you read Amin Ma'luf's uh, The Crusades Through Arab Eyes, Ma'luf makes a very, very important point, and everybody forgets this. As far as the Arab world is concerned, the Crusades was just like some fighting going on in the backyard. Why? Because the center of Arab Muslim civilization by then had moved. What are the centers? Baghdad. And then the non-Arab Asian Muslim centers, Persia, the Mongol Empire, right? Turkey. Yeah? They're not fighting the Crusades. They're fight they, they, are, they are turning east because, because the center of the Muslim world has moved east. So the Europe, Europeans come at the 16th century with this sort of hangover from the Crusades, and they bring with them the vocabulary of the Crusades. So, so what, okay, what's, what's the Thai word for European? Ferang, Ferang, which comes from? Come on, Joyce. Ferengi. Ferengi, Ferengi, Franks, right? Franks, Frankish, right? So, so this is so from Franks to Ferengi to Farang, the vocabulary of the religious wars of Europe, the Franks, the Saracens, the Moors, they permeate into Southeast Asia. So that sets the stage. But this then changes because the mid period of Western e Asian contact begins with the emergence of the modern colonial companies. And then you have things like the Dutch East Indies Company, the French Compagnie des Ondes, the British East India Company. And if we look at all the charters, the East India Company makes it very clear, no priests. This is a commercial mission. Why? Because Europe has gone through secularization. And so it becomes a completely commercial venture. In fact, we don't want any priests. We don't want conversion. Why? Because if you convert and if they become Christians, then we have to treat them as equals. It's actually better to leave them as they are. So it's a completely different mindset uh, that comes. Uh, um, uh, Wilson, uh, or is it Winstead? Winstead, in his account, talks about how when the Dutch take over the Portuguese fortifications in Malacca, you know, uh, uh, Alfamosa, which is there, you know, if you, if you all take the bus, go to Malacca, have some durian or whatever, you can visit Alfamosa on the hill. Now, when the Portuguese were there, they, they were coming in the 15th, 15th, 16th century, they're fighting a religious war. So, so the, what are the buildings in Alfamosa? They're all named after saints, they're named after Mary. The moment the Dutch East, India, East Indies Company takes over Malacca, what do they do? They rename all the buildings according to the board of directors of the company because money is the new religion, right? This is the beginning of colonial capitalism. And from that point onwards, you know, 
so, so that early religious conflict then becomes far more complex. And religion, along with race, ethnicity, culture, notions of civilization or uncivilized, all these things blend into this really complex, you know, conceptual alphabet soup um, that by the time you get to the 19th century, you have a very multi-layered understanding of identity and difference. Every new contact adds another layer. That's how we understand culture. Culture is like a crab shell. It's like a carapace. You add one layer, you add one layer, what? add one layer. You never erase the earlier layer. So to go back to the earlier question, then a lot of these disputes we are seeing now, some of them date back 300, 400 years because they're grievances that go back to the 16th century, 15th century that were never resolved. Because before that could be resolved, then came colonial capitalism. After that came racialized colonial capitalism. So we never resolve these disputes. And so these issues remain there, and they're always latent. And they're latent in the way that you know, these tropes, these metaphors, they, they keep popping up. They pop up in you know, lousy, unfunny, politically incorrect humor. They pop up in stereotypes and in um, all kinds of metaphors. But they're there. And that's why it's interesting when you look at Southeast Asia. The, you know, Southeast Asia, any part of Southeast Asia, you just dig, you know, you'll find layers and layers and layers of meaning there, always, in the words, the symbols, the colors, everything that we eat, see, do, say. It's such a complex, overdetermined part of the world. I'm sorry, I think that was more than five minutes. <laughs> thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Please join me to thank Dr. Farish for a very interesting lecture.